On the evening of the 14th of April, the English set up camp on the western bank of a brook that emptied into the Loire River. During the following night, Kirill stationed an outpost on a hillock near Trevière to watch Richemont's movements to the south. A blocking detachment was posted on the main road, near the top of the slope that overlooked the stone bridge, to alert of Clermont's approach from the west. Before first light, Goff rode off to Bayeux to ask for support in ambushing the French. Battle was upon them. But first, a paid ad for Jurassic World Alive. They are alive. Dinosaurs have returned to rule the Earth and they're roaming free in your cities and neighborhoods. Jurassic World Alive is a free-to-play, fast-paced battle RPG mobile game available to download today. Enter the immersive dinosaur world and embark on a high-intensity mission to save them from a second extinction. Start exploring to find your favorite dinosaurs, including new breeds that are more awe-inspiring and terrifying than ever before. Best of all, you can activate augmented reality to discover and interact with these unbelievable creatures in the real world and play with them in your very own backyard. Thanks to Jam City for sponsoring today's video. You can experience all the action and excitement of Jurassic World Alive for free on your mobile device or tablet today by using my link below or scanning the QR code on screen. With the war in France moving against them in the 1440s, the English needed a truce. King Henry VI's incompetent rule had weakened the army and failed to address the worsening economic situation, leaving England unable to afford to continue the war. Meanwhile, France was resurgent under the leadership of King Charles VII. There was little hope of getting favorable terms for the English. When the delegations met at Tours on the 28th of May 1444, Henry agreed to relinquish the Duchy of Maine and betrothed Margaret of Anjou, niece of King Charles VII, in exchange for a two-year truce. But instead of taking advantage of the break in the fighting to reorganize, the English did nothing. Charles, meanwhile, used the truce to strengthen the French army. He did not disband French forces after the signing of the Treaty of Tours. Instead, he purged the army of the poor quality units. The best performing units were retained as a large standing force. To add to that, every village in France of between 50 and 80 households were given certain tax exemptions in exchange for providing one combatant at their own expense, usually a crossbowman. This created a nationwide body of trained and well-equipped soldiers, ready to be called upon when needed. Development of modern gunpower artillery and extensive training of gun crews was undertaken. Most importantly, Charles began reforms to improve cohesion between the infantry, cavalry, and artillery arms, creating a flexible, fast-moving force that could operate across vast distances. He then tested his reinvigorated army in other theatres, supporting Frederick of Austria against the Swiss and leading a punitive expedition against the city of Metz in support of the Duke of Lorraine. Charles would soon be ready for a final showdown with the dreaded English. But across the Channel, no such measures were taken in England. Some in Parliament warned that the Duchy of Normandy must be rearmed, restocked, and kept in a state of readiness for the resumption of the war. But there was a lack of political will and financial resources to implement this. Worse, in Normandy the truce was seen as an opportunity to pay less taxes for defenses, and the magnates of men resisted the terms of the Treaty of Tours, refusing to give up their land holdings and tax base. This went on for four years, the meek Henry unable to force them to cede the county, as per the agreement with France. Charles had finally lost patience. In February 1448, he entrusted John, Count of Dunois, with capturing Le Mans, the capital of the county. 
The speed with which Shala mobilized 6,000 troops shocked the English magnates. To pacify Henry and allow him to salvage some pride, Shala compensated his nephew with a payment equal to 10-year revenue from the ceded territory. Besieged in the capital of men and abandoned by their king by the end of March 1448, the English had no choice but to leave. But Henry, instead of demanding that the surrender of Le Mans be a binding condition for peace, naively gave up the city as a gesture of goodwill to induce Charla to make peace, who in turn embarrassed Henry by granting him a mere two-year extension of the truce of Tours until the 1st of April 1450. This debacle finally prompted the English to act. Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, was sent across the Channel as the new Lieutenant General and Governor of Normandy, with 200 men-at-arms. For the past three years, the lack of governorship in the duchy saw a steady deterioration of defences and administration. Discipline was low, unpaid soldiers left their garrisons and turned to brigandry. Lawlessness was widespread. Upon arriving at Rouen in May 1448, Beaufort took immediate action to address these problems. A duchy-wide muster was held to evaluate the troops, and steps were taken to strengthen the garrisons. An investigation against corruption of royal officials was launched, with those found guilty of fraud and theft of tax money, fined and sacked. But Charla had no intention of letting the English build up, pick up steam. Despite the new two-year extension of the Treaty of Tours, both sides repeatedly breached the agreement. French raiding parties intercepting English transports of provisions and weapons on the Seine and English detachments plundering French towns were just some of the many violations. Such border clashes, however, were standard for the time, serving to intimidate the enemy more than anything else. But Charles felt he was ready and he needed an excuse. He would soon get one in the form of Francois de Sorienne, a foreign mercenary captain serving the English, who seized the wealthy fortified town of Fougeres in the marches of Brittany. The indignant Francis I, Duke of Brittany, demanded the city be returned and reparations paid. Ignored by the English, he appealed to Charles, who took up his cause with enthusiasm, the incident playing straight into his hand. With several armies at the ready for months, the king began the reconquest of Normandy in June 1449. The French quickly took the initiative. Two armies, led by Duke Francis and his uncle Arthur de Richemont, advanced from Brittany into Lower Normandy. The force of Dunois, the bastard of Orléans, advanced from the south through the centre assisted by the army of the Duke of Alençon from his base in Anjou. Another two armies, commanded by the Counts of Eu and Saint-Paul, advanced from Picardy into Upper Normandy. The relentless invasion overwhelmed the English defences, the French retaking much of Normandy by October. Strong fortified towns and cities remained in English hands, but making use of their modern artillery, the French captured Rouen in October 1449, stunning the English. The fortress of Belém and the supposedly impregnable Chateau Gaillard capitulated in late November. The vital port of Arfleur held out until Christmas before surrendering. Arfleur and Frenois were taken in January of 1450. Many other strongholds fell by February. King Charles' lightning operation in Normandy signaled a new era in warfare. In a desperate bid to stay in the fight, the English sent armaments and supplies to the ports of Caen and Cherbourg. 
Sir Thomas Kiriel embarked for France with 2,500 troops, including 425 men-at-arms and a large artillery train. Transporting so many cannons suggests that his army was intended for recovering captured strongholds. The plan was likely to land at Caen and join forces with Beaufort, and then begin a campaign of extending the English-controlled territory beyond the caen bayeux axis. But inexplicably, Kiriel landed at Cherbourg, an isolated port city on the northern tip of the Coutentin. He marched on Valogne, which endured a three-week-long siege before surrendering, but only after Matthew Goff brought reinforcements numbering 1,800 from Caen, Bayeux, and Vire, increasing the English host to around 5,000 troops. To the south at Carenton, the 3,000-strong French army of Jean de Bourbon, the Count of Clermont, was blocking the English march. Kirill garrisoned Valogne with around 1,000 men and broke camp with the remaining 4,000 men. Avoiding Carenton, he moved directly across the bay, using the low tide to cut across the shallow water, before proceeding towards Bayeux, some 60 miles away. But the French guards in the church tower at Carenton spotted the English. Clermont mobilized and went after them, sending word to Arthur de Richemont at Saint-Lô to march his 2,000-strong force north to assist in intercepting the English. Two days into the march, Kirill encamped near the village of Formogny, about 10 miles from Bayeux. On the evening of the 14th of April, the English set up camp on the western bank of a brook that emptied into the Loire River. During the following night, Kirill stationed an outpost on a hillock near Trevière to watch Richemont's movements to the south. A blocking detachment was posted on the main road, near the top of the slope that overlooked the stone bridge, to alert of Clermont's approach from the west. Before first light, Goff rode off to Bayeux to ask for support in ambushing the French. Fearing being surrounded, at dawn of the 15th of April, the English constructed a small field fortification to the east of Formigny. To the west, they dug up trenches and set up archer stakes to guard against a French cavalry attack. By 9 a.m., Goff returned from Bayeux and resumed command of his men. Sometime during the morning, Clermont's vanguard appeared on the main road to the west, preceded by French scouts, sent to reconnoiter the English positions. The main body followed about half an hour later. Learning of Clermont's approach, Kirill deployed his army. His plan was to array his 4,000 troops along the top of the slope, arching above the main road and bridge, behind a trench and a row of stakes. The infantry division straddled the main road, while the mounted contingents and archers were posted on the far left under the command of Goff. Around 1 p.m., some two miles to the south, Richemont's scouts and men of the vanguard began trickling in, ahead of the 2,000-strong contingent. Richemont himself was yet to appear with the main body. Back north, around 2 p.m., Clermont's force of 3,000 men had by now deployed west of the stone bridge and advanced slowly to about half a mile distance from the English line. Clermont ordered two light guns to be brought forward to bombard Kirill's position, sending 200 dismounted archers and around 60 lancers to defend the cannons. Observing the strong defensible position of the English, and realizing he is outnumbered, Clermont decided against a head-on assault. 
Instead, he gathered local peasants from the villages of Le Petit Amont and Normanville, ordering them to head south and look for Richemont. Around 3.30 p.m., Richemont reached Trevière and stopped his army after spotting the English outpost on the hill above the village. With the forest stretching along the Lure River blocking his view towards the south, he had no way of knowing the position of the enemy army, so he paused his movement to organize his troops and scout ahead. Back at the stone bridge, the two French guns, now in position, opened fire on the English line. A few shots found their marks, the rate of fire of the well-drilled French gun crews surprising the English. But as the cannon smoke piled up, Goff sent 600 archers to cross the bridge and drive off the French gunners. Meanwhile to the south, Richemont scouts returned, reporting that the north bank of the Lure River was safe with no enemy in sight. Making his way towards Formigny, Richemont turned his host to cross the river at Pont de la Barre. It was around this time that the local peasants located him, bringing news that Clermont was in trouble, urging Richemont to hurry north. Some 20 minutes later, Goff's 600 archers attacking the bridge showered the French on the other side. Clermont's 200 archers could not match the English volleys. The French gun crews fired off several more shots at Goff's bowmen, but failed to disperse them. Hard pressed by the English arrow volleys, the French troops at the bridge pulled back towards the main line. Chasing after them, about a hundred Englishmen stormed the bridge, while the rest kept up the arrow volleys, capturing the two guns and beginning to pull them back towards their own position. By now, the head of Richemont's column appeared on the plateau to the south, near the village of Le Petit Amour. The French commander climbed up a windmill to observe the ongoing battle near the stone bridge. The English spotted Richemont's banners to the south, initially mistaking them for English reinforcements that they were expecting to arrive from Bayeux. But once Kirill's scouts brought back word the troops on the plateau were in fact the enemy, the English commander ordered a complete redeployment along a new line where he could receive the attack from the two French forces. The infantry regrouping was done in good order, but Goff's withdrawal to the new position was disrupted by French archers, inflicting losses on the English. Clermont ordered his vanguard and archers forward against the English still at the bridge, who were guarding the captured guns. Meanwhile, Richemont arrived to see Clermont in person to discuss the situation. They agreed not to focus their attack through the bottleneck at the stone bridge. Instead, Richemont would attack first from the south, where the undulating terrain permitted an easier approach to the English line. With that, Richemont rode off to retake command of his main force on the plateau. Meanwhile at the bridge, the French men-at-arms under Pierre de Brézé drove off the English detachment and retook the guns. Brézé, seeing that the English left wing was still redeploying, remounted his men and attacked Goff's dispersed ranks. Seeing the charge of Brézé's men-at-arms, Richemont ordered his force to advance northeast against the English left. Brézé and his lancers caught up with Goff's contingent, hacking their way through the disorganized enemy ranks. Amidst the fighting, Brézé spotted the English field fortifications to the east and decided to fight his way through to capture the fortifications and block the enemy's retreat. Meanwhile, Clermont ordered a general advance over the bridge. With Richemont's men now joining the fray, the pressure on the English left became too great. Goff tried to rally his cavalry, but they soon broke and fled towards Bayeux, pursued by Brézé 
and his mounted men-at-arms. Seeing Goff's flight on the left, Kirill pulled his men back to organize a new line of defense in the village. The English withstood the ferocious attack from the south, but gradually gave ground as they tried to solidify their line. As the gruesome battle raged at the village, Brézé drove Goff and most of the English cavalry off the field, capturing their field fortifications to the east of Formigny. Meanwhile, having crossed the stone bridge, Clermont's main force closed in on the English, disrupting their redeployment at Formigny. Attacked from both the west and south, and unable to get his men back into formation, Kirill realized the day was lost. Many of his men were slaughtered trying to flee, while he and several other commanders were captured. The Battle of Formigny ended what little hope there had been that the reconquest of Normandy could be stopped, least of all reversed. Over the next four months, the English were driven out, with the final stronghold of Cherbourg surrendering on the 12th of August, 1450. The humiliation and anger felt in England were matched only by the jubilation in France. Now, with northern France secure, Charles VII turned his attention to Gascony. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.